Rudy Deal was born in Holland's capital city of Amsterdam on the 1st of September 1962 to George Hulit and his partner Ria Deal. While his mother was a native of the city, Rudy's father was an immigrant from Suriname, which was a Dutch colony in South America at the time, having relocated to the Netherlands right before the large influx of Surinamese settlers of the 70s. Hullet Sr. was accompanied by his friend Herman Reichard, and the pair flew across the Atlantic in search of a better life in the bustling capital. Raised working class in the suburb of Jordan, a couple of years passed before the family made a slight move across the city to Amsterdam's Old West, living near Balboa Plain Square, a popular proving ground for the neighbourhood's aspiring players. Here, he met Frank Reichard, the son of his father's now distant friend Herman, and the 11-year-olds hit it off. Deal convinced Reichard to join AFC DWS, and their friendship became a brotherhood. Both wore afros, were taller and naturally more athletic than their peers, causing the coaches to actually confuse them. By 16, the Dutch under-21s had welcomed him, and the ever-present Ajax leapt at both the youngsters in pursuit of their signatures succeeding with Rijkaard, but were late to the party with Dill a year prior, who had been approached by an eager Barry Hughes, the manager of HFC Harlem, in September 1978. The pair were now set to diverge and make their strides in the Eredivisie, with Dill, known by now as Rude Hullet, stepping first in the August of the ensuing year, the youngest debutante in the league's history, one month shy of 17 years old. Initially a centre-back, the new boy instantly found his footing in the first team, exuding a surprising level of confidence in the deep-sweeping role. On his 19th birthday, the Holland senior side finally offered him his first minutes, coming on for Rijkaard in a friendly against Switzerland, but having failed to qualify for both the 1982 World Cup and later the 84 European Championship also, these were dark days for Aranya. His third and what would be concluding season in Harlem was the club's best to date, finishing fourth and qualifying for the UEFA Cup with Hullet a key player up top, dubbed the Dutch Duncan Edwards by Hughes. Now his quality couldn't be ignored, as Arsenal and Ipswich Town seemed a possible next destination for the wonder kid. Although Hullet had picked up a party boy reputation in the capital, which repelled the English managers Terry Neal and Bobby Robson, believing £30,000 was a stretch for a wild kid. The move overseas was not to come yet, and instead he answered the calls of Feyenoord, the Rotterdam-based rivals of Ajax, for whom he signed in 1982. Deployed mainly towards the right of the front line or in the number 10 role, he had next to no defensive duties, free to enjoy himself on the attack. The club on the Meuse went trophyless in Hullet's opening campaign, and in order to overcome the Amsterdammers, Feyenoord looked to add to their lineup. Ajax surprisingly denied a new contract to their greatest ever player, Johan Cruyff, who at 36 spited his boyhood club by signing for their adversary in 1983 a major boost that would come back to bite the champions. By the tender age of 21, Hullet found himself sharing a dressing room with his idol, which beyond all else was an educational experience. Cruyff exposed the awestruck mind of Hullet to the mentality that made him so successful, opening his eyes up to the liberty a player can have in any position and tactically, the combination of the iconic 14 with assistant manager Wim van Hanneham left an invaluable impression on the talented youngster. A visible on-pitch understanding developed between the pair, and they catapulted Feyenoord to the title as well as the cup, completing a famous domestic double. It was the swan song of the legend's glorious career, and featuring an all but one match as their talisman, he was awarded the Golden Boot, while Hullet, after his breakthrough season, was voted the 1984 Dutch Footballer of the Year, scoring at a rate of a goal every other game. His third year continued in familiar fashion, en route to his best season yet. However, in March, a ligament tear rendered him futile for 11 matches in the latter half of the season, and final dropped to third by June. Despite the title victory and Cruyff experience, his time in Rotterdam had been no bed of roses. 
Pullet clashed with manager Thijs Librechts, who racially profiled the Dutchman, giving him an offensive nickname regarding his skin colour and singling him out as lazy. With five Eredivisie years under his belt, Pulitz was finally ready to make his last step up in Dutch football, and did so in the summer of 85, when PSV shelled out 1.2 million Dutch guilders to bring the rising star to Eindhoven. Sporting the number 10, he was the focus of Jan Reker's side, who assisted by a younger Goose Hiddink, had planned to build the team around Hullet, their new captain. The 23-year-old proved why he had the armband, bringing his personality to the club and running things on the pitch with his intelligent passing and forceful sprints. Balancing time between sweeper and centre forward, his breathtaking strength, mixed with a rare level of grace and poise for one so tall, made Hullet outstandingly effective for PSV. Like a Rolls-Royce in the deep roll and a Lamborghini on the offence, the talisman contributed a career-high 24 goals in his entry season, as well as providing another 13 in assists to help them become victors for the first time in eight years. Established now as a world-class footballer, he had thrived under increased pressure, showing his aptitude as the leader of a triumphant team, for which he picked up a second Dutch Footballer of the Year award. The subsequent season was similarly brilliant from both Hullet and the club, as the skipper made 22 goal contributions before the new year, and Boren suffered merely two league losses all season. Sporting director Hans Cray had taken over as manager when Raker returned to Venlo before the contest got underway, but in March 1987, Hullet publicly criticised both PSV and Cray heavily, discontent with his own progress. Self-admittedly, the captain took on the weight of responsibility all by himself and was overzealous at times, but nevertheless his words triggered Cray's resignation and Hiddink stepped in. With only 10 matches left to hurdle Ajax, who had a three-point lead, Hullet emerged as the hero, finding the back of the net six times in the closing five games to bypass the leaders and gain a six-point gap with which PSV won another championship, going back-to-back. -back. Having scored 46 times in 68 fixtures for PSV and spearheading them to consecutive titles, Hullet had achieved what he set out to do and now was primed to conquer a different stage, Europe. With a raised profile and distinctive appearance, he'd caught the eye of the top five leagues. Yet PSV, aware that they had a world beater at their disposal, would only accept top dollar to let him go. In the prior summer, the technical director of AC Milan had seen Hullet in action and approached him in Barcelona during a pre-season tournament the hefty price tag was met in the form of just over 7 million euros in today's money, a world record transfer fee at the time, and that same window, Milan acquired another emerging Dutch star, Marco van Basten of Ajax, who was coming off the back of four seasons in a row as the division's top scorer. The Rossineri were in a phase of transition. Silvio Berlusconi bought the struggling club in 86, hoping to return Milan to the glory days of the 1960s. The billionaire selected Parma's Arrigo Sacchi to manage the side, but as this would be the 41-year-old's first ever Serie A season, his credibility was brought into question. Wanting to switch it up, going against the conventional defensive Catanaccio approach, with the impetus instead on pressing aggressive football, the unproven northerner took instantly to Hullet, whose time in Holland had helped him develop an attractive attacking style. Also, considering Van Basten's season-long ankle injury, Saki was relying on him in the goals department, and as second striker to Paolo Verdis, the dreadlocked Dutchman thrived immediately upon arrival in Italy, scoring in the first league match against Pisa. Splendido goal di Gullit. Thanks to the new arrivals and fresh methods of Saki, Milan showed a level of stability that hadn't been seen from them in years, clutching onto their spot in second for most of the months and in tight contest with the holders, Napoli. On the verge of 1988, Hullet was presented with the ultimate individual accolade, the Ballon d'Or, acknowledged as the world's number one. He dedicated the Golden Ball to his friend, Nelson Mandela, 
the famous anti-apartheid activist during the humanitarian's 27-year sentence. Reggae music had been a passion of the Dutchman, through the medium of which he spread the word of figures like Mandela and Steve Biko, even charting later that year with a song called South Africa by Revelation Time. Quickly, he was becoming more than a player. Now a global icon with a unique look and outspoken views, Hullet was one of the world's few sporting superstars. The Italian competition was fierce, and the Serie A was deemed the toughest division in Europe. Therefore, Hullet had more difficulty breaching the rigid defences, managing nine goals by the end of April. However, his eighth and ninth assists of the year were vital in defeating the Neapolitans to the audience of 90,000 on their home turf. With the three points, the Rossineri leapfrogged the Azzurri and went on to ensure the Scudetto for the first time in nine years. In the words of the gaffer, his strong character was imperative to the side's success, and the number 10 helped Saki change the team's mindset from the country's cautious standard to a confident, thrilling, all-or-nothing attitude. Club honours had now been attained, and in the summer of 88, the European Championship offered a chance for the international success that had eluded his generation. Failing to qualify for the previous three major tournaments, the Netherlands flew to West Germany as neither heavy favourites nor underdogs, and started poorly, but recovered form after their opening match to advance past the groups. Hullet's pair of assists helped the returning Van Basten convert a hat-trick for a needed win over England, and Rinus Mikkel's group went on to face the hosts in a heated encounter. The Germans took the lead, but through Ronald Koeman's spot kick and the Swan of Utrecht's 88th minute strike, Oranje reached the first Euros final. Leading out his nation as captain, the Milanista struck first in Munich, butting the ball into the net inside the first half. Nine minutes into the second, Van Basten etched his way into football's history book to seal the deal. The skipper was now a cultural phenom, the black tulip of a renovated Netherlands team, whose skill and strength across the pitch gave them a contemporary feel to put Holland back on the map and inspire the upcoming generation. As a pivotal feature of the back line, Rijkaard was viewed by Hullet as a needed addition to Milan. After desperate pleading from Milan's duchies, Saki was convinced. Rijkaard completed the famous Dutch trio of AC Milan, as the final piece of Saki's jigsaw moved up into midfield in front of a renowned back four. Demanding hard work, Saki set up rigorous training regimes to promote discipline in his sides, which prepared them well for Europe, re-entering the biggest club competition after a nine-year hiatus. They waltzed through the early stages, and off the back of a one-all tie at the Bernabeu, Milan whitewashed Real Madrid 5-0 in scintillating fashion, including a goal for each of the Hollanders. In the 56th minute, Hullet went down, and left the San Siro injured, which spurred concerns. But surgery and rest from the domestic games was enough for the striker to return in late May for the final. Almost 100,000 filled the new Camp, a crowd dominated by red and black as Milan took on a formidable Stijl Bucharest side. The 1986 victors were schooled by the Italians in a pressing 4-4-2, with all 10 outfield players on the same wavelength from the beginning whistle. Divvying up the goals with his frontline partner, Hullet tapped in the first, Van Basten headed in the second, a volley from the ten added the third, before Milan's top scorer slotted a fourth past Silvio Lung, completing another devastating victory. Ticking off yet another trophy from his bucket list, Hullet lifted the European Cup, cementing this Italian period, both individually and as a collective, the zenith. Il Diavolo followed this up by bettering Medellin's Atletico Nacional and Barcelona in the Intercontinental and Super Cups respectively to announce themselves as not just the kings of Europe, but the planet. Hullet, however, was reduced to the stands for these games, as his April injury came back with a vengeance and was far more serious. 
Damage to the ligaments of his right knee limited the 27-year-old to a torturous three matches across the entire 1989-90 campaign, all coming at the very end of the nine months. Coming back to the pitch in late April of the new decade, Hullet saw that Saki's unit had handled things well in his absence, making it to another European Cup final for which the Dutchman would be fit to start. Vienna was the city this time, and the opposition were Benfica, a classic example of Portuguese tactics, structured and regimented, just like Milan, and hence this time the bout was arduous. Stalemated until the 68th minute, it was eventually Rijkaard who broke the deadlock and won the holders another title, establishing Saki's Milan as one of history's greatest ever teams. Needing not to travel, Hullet stayed in Italy that summer for the 1990 World Cup, his first, and though it should have been a time for excitement, the Dutch camp had problems. Leo Beenhacker, the manager, was appointed against the squad's wishes for Cruyff, and Hullet's knee trouble prompted doubt about his ability to captain Oranje. The internal feuding and lack of cohesion cost them in the end, sent packing after a chaotic last 16 tie facing the Germans, the skipper's fourth and what would be final World Cup game. The fallout of Italia 90 left the boyhood buddies on frail terms upon their return to the fashion capital, and even though Hullet was able to feature for most of the matches, bagging seven goals in the league, Milan endured their first trophyless season since Saki's arrival, and the former shoe salesman stepped back to coach the national side. Fabio Capello kicked off his career on the touchline as Saki's replacement, and despite his label as a Berlusconi yes-man, the ex-midfielder re-railed them on the track to trophies. From the right wing, Hullet gave his best output in years, scoring seven goals and providing nine assists from 26 matches, including some points-winning efforts as a key cog in the Rossoneri system that accomplished a rare feat. For all 34 of their league games in the 91-92 season, Capello's Milan went unbeaten, winning 22 and drawing 12 to finally reclaim the Scudetto. This record-shattering run bled into their following campaign, extended to 58 matches without losing, and they were dubbed Glee Invincibili, the Invincibles. Yet Hullet had played a more peripheral role as Capello was reluctant to field him given the problems with his knees, and his omission from the 1993 Champions League final, which they lost, was the final straw. The relationship between he and the club was slightly marred, provoking Hullet to make a move, journeying to the Genoese club of Sampdoria, where he could be afforded game time by Sven Goran Eriksson and prove he still got it. Shoulder to shoulder with Roberto Mancini in attack, the number four did exactly that, recording his highest Italian tally with 15 goals in one season, amid which was a thunderous hit versus his former employers. A respectable third place finish and first ever Coppa Italia topped off what had been a refreshing year away from San Siro. A sombre summer ensued. Dick Advocat emerged as Holland's new head coach, and like Capello didn't trust his fitness, sparking arguments between them, and in the end, Hullet walked out of a training camp ahead of the 1994 US World Cup, before announcing his full retirement from international football. Purely to rekindle the romance, he re-signed for Milan as a brief cameo later that year, making 14 appearances in the red and black strip before reverting to Iblucia Chiatti, where he concluded his eight-year-long Italian escapade. Soon to be 33, his next step was an unpredictable one. Fancying the challenge of the fast-rising English Premier League, he put pen to paper for Chelsea on a free transfer in July of 95. Needing a change of pace, London was a drastic but welcome change for Hullet, who later expressed that his time in England was the happiest of his career and like a holiday compared to Italy. Under Glenn Hoddle, 
he went back to his roots in the sweeper role he'd made his own as a 20 year old and did so with such grace and skill that he played a part in tactically transforming the English top flight. Gradually rolling into the mid where he could have more of an impact on the overall tempo of the game, the Amsterdammer amassed six goals in all competitions to be voted runner-up to Eric Cantona as England's Footballer of the Year. From this point, his position changed in a different way. Hoddle pounced at the offer to coach the Three Lions, and Hullet assumed his place as the Blues' player manager to commence his coaching career. The latter half of 96 saw the Italian revolution of the West Londoners, and under the Dutchman, Chelsea went on to win the 1997 FA Cup, ending their 28-year drought. Hullet had promptly broken the mould of the Prem, becoming the first non-British and first ever black manager to win a major trophy in Britain. The FA Cup belongs to Chelsea. Onwards, Hullet's Chelsea showed only great signs during his second year in charge, but an alleged disagreement with the board resulted in owner Ken Bates showing him the door as the midfielder was cut loose, marking the forced retirement of a footballing great. Gifted beyond belief, Ruud Hullet was one of his generation's finest talents and a man whose legacy should never be forgotten. A perfect example of the Dutch concept of total football, his versatility was a trait we seldom see in the modern game, but one that made him who he was. Adept in quite literally every position, the Man Mountain could fit any system on command, whether as a sweeper, midfielder, winger or striker, and do so flawlessly. A pure athlete from his childhood to his 40s, Captain Dredd had it all, from the pace and endurance to the 6 foot 3 height and upper body strength, which complemented by his street football skills made him the best in the world on his day. Suave and elegant with the ball, tireless and tenacious without it, the specimen was unplayable in the early days of PSV and particularly Milan, where he is still remembered as the megastar of a legendary class. The now pundit is a man with strong opinions, who used his celebrity to break down boundaries and promote causes that mattered, fueled and undeterred by the racial abuse suffered his entire life. As two of the first distinguished Surinamese Hollanders, he and Rijkaard revolutionised Dutch football, opening the gates for the forthcoming generation. Teenagers may just know his name and face from FIFA, but for those lucky enough to have seen Hullet in his pomp, they know he was an artistic monster of a player, up there with the most complete of all time.